I am somebody. I am somebody. I may be poor, but I am somebody. I may be on welfare, but I am somebody. I may be hungry, but I am somebody. I am black, beautiful, proud. I must be respected. I must be respected. I am God's child. I am God's child. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Look out. It's not often realized that many of the forefathers of today's black Americans came not from an empty African wilderness, but from towns like this. Here, 300 years ago, a civilization thrived, ignorant of European influence. It felt secure. But slavery ended all that. Flourishing societies were destroyed, families split and towns pillaged and 10 million were carted off to the Americas and the Caribbean. Aboard the ships, the slaves were packed like rows of books on a shelf, chained two by two, right leg and left leg, right hand and left hand. Each slave had less room than a man in a coffin. The slaves who were sold in the Caribbean and North America were treated as cruelly as any slaves in history. Roman slaves at least had a codified system of law to protect them. Slavery within the domain of the Catholic kings was fairly rigorously controlled. But here these historical precedents had no hold. Economic success was almost the sole criterion of value. It took years of campaigning by the abolitionists and a bloody civil war before President Lincoln finally freed the slaves three centuries after slavery began. Soon the southern legislatures were filled with black representatives and senators but not for long. Within a decade of the ending of the Civil War, sudden strength and prejudice were reasserting themselves. The Negro was stripped of his vote, trains and restaurants were segregated. The Negro could only exist as the servant of the white man. Not even the rule of law would protect him. Lynching was the accepted final deterrent in the South and continued to be until fairly recent times. A man could be mutilated and strung up for the most trivial of offenses, without any attempt at a trial. Then there was the constant reiteration of the theme that the Negro was unacceptable, dirty, lazy, and lacking in ambition. Indeed, most American blacks became convinced that they were somehow inferior. This even came out strongly in a recent research study of three to seven-year-old black children carried out by Professor Kenneth Clark. And once we had assured ourselves that they knew that a leaf was generally green and an apple red and orange orange, we then, uh, if we were a little boy, we would say to the little boy, uh, color this little boy the color you are. And after he, had, and by the way, there was were about 24 crayons of various colors before him, he could select the color that he thought he was, or would, as we found out, would like to be. And after he'd done that, we said, now here's a little girl. Color this little girl the color that you like little girls to be. Here's a, a little boy who accepts the fact of his own brown skin color, as indicated by coloring the face here. But when I asked him to color little girls the color he likes little girls to be, 
he doesn't choose yellow or pink. He takes the white crayon and makes sure that one clearly understands that he prefers the little girl to be chalk white, in a sense. Uh, and one cannot explain that in terms of a confusion of color-object relationship, because actually he made no such confusion in coloring the leaf, as you can see there. Those are the general pattern uh, response to this coloring test, which tended to support our findings from the dolls test, that a racist society does pretty horrible things to human beings. And uh, I guess sometimes it's better not to know. Why do you uh, say that? Because I don't know that we would have uh, voluntarily been the agents of bringing into consciousness for young children the stark awareness of their rejection of themselves. Uh, some of the children cried and uh, seemed you know, very upset. Uh, and my wife and I felt helpless in we, we couldn't remake the society right then to make these children feel wanted. The society already made perfectly clear to them that they were unwanted. And what did you learn from all this? What we learned was that it could be rather awful uh, when human beings are being required to grow up in a society which systematically rejects them, excludes them, tells them that they are unworthy. The horrible thing is that the human beings at a very tender age, a defenseless age, begin to believe this. four or five decades of this century, it seemed as if black people were doomed to subservience and inferiority. Progress was slow, leadership weak and competitive, and white consciousness minimal. The needs of a war economy during the Second World War and the Korean War had forced some measure of equality. So did the Supreme Court decision in 1954, desegregating schools. But the black person's world remained, for the most part, miserably unchanged. Then, on December the 1st, 1955, in Montgomery, Alabama, a black woman refused to give up her seat in a bus to the white man who demanded it. For this was what blacks were expected to do, as well as sitting at the back of the bus. The response was a boycott. For over a year, the black population refused to use the city buses. The city gave in, the buses were desegregated, and history changed. A young man of 26, Dr. Martin Luther King, led the boycott. It wasn't a, merely a victory for 16 million Negroes of America. That was a victory for justice. He was in his first job as pastor of a small Baptist church. Ironically, it was only a stone's throw from the Civil War capital of the southern states. King then moved to take on the whole South, everywhere meeting harsh and uncompromising opposition. But it was in Birmingham, Alabama, in 1963, that King met his strongest opposition, from men like police chief Bull Connor. Well, I've just gotten through a couple of weeks ago with a 45 or 46 day battle in of Ingram Park, I call it. That's the park there in Birmingham where we stopped Martin Luther King. And I mean, ladies and gentlemen, we had that nigga whip. But they haven't. King brought Birmingham to its knees. How it happened is explained by King's closest associate, Andrew Young. I think what we did was we changed the relationship between men. 
that in Birmingham, when 250,000 black men refused to buy anything except food and medicine, they changed the nature of the economy. And people's hearts didn't change necessarily, but they realized that if they wanted black men to spend their money again, uh, they had to enter into a new relationship economically, where instead of just taking money from the black community, they began to give jobs and to treat people courteously and give them equal services. The success of King's campaign in Birmingham pushed President Kennedy to introduce the Civil Rights Bill. But King and a quarter of a million others had to march on Washington when it looked as if the bill might be defeated in Congress. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood? I have a dream that one day that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. A year later, President Johnson signed the first major piece of legislation which had attempted to improve Negro rights for almost a hundred years. It had taken Kennedy's assassination to stir enough consciences to assure the bill's passage. The bill did not, however, guarantee the Negro the right to vote. To secure this basic right was the aim of King's next campaign. Every day, thousands of Negroes would queue to register to vote. King's organizers battled against continuous white hostility. What you're really trying to do is intimidate these people and by making them stand in the raid, keep them from registering to vote. And this, this is a kind of violation of the Constitution, the violation of the court order, the violation of decent citizenship. You can turn your back on me, but you cannot turn your back upon the idea of justice. You can turn your back now and you can keep the club in your hand, but you cannot beat down justice. And we will register to vote because as citizens of these United States, we have the right to do it. I'm looking down the line, seeing all the people who've been in jail for felonies. That's what I'm looking Precisely at. Precisely right. And if, they, and if they're not fit to vote, you'll be able to find that out. But you'll not know it until they're, until they're on the registrar. And many of those have a felony action because Sheriff Clark made them a felony action, not because they were rightfully misused. Anymore. All right, here I am. I'm standing here. Yeah. Now, I have, right to, I have a right according to, 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 uh, to yeah. the Judge right, Thomas's order. Now. I have a right according to Judge Thomas's order to be here. Come on, let us go. Do we have a right to go? Do you want us to beat us or arrest us? Arrest us if we're wrong. Don't beat us. If we're wrong, arrest us, but don't beat us. And I can tell the American people this, that this group who came to our state and who led these uh, demonstrations and who were present here, many of them belong to communist front organizations. I understand, I understand a number of students were here who also raised money for the Viet Cong. Yet King's campaign in the South won the voting rights bill. Meanwhile, the North had been building up its own brand of political organization, born out of the harshness of slum life. The black Muslims, led by Elijah Muhammad, wanted blacks to secede from America with three or four independent states. They owed their tremendous appeal to the dynamic leadership of Elijah's deputy, Malcolm X. Malcolm X later broke with Elijah in his strange religious ways. His influence grew, particularly on the younger civil rights workers, people like Stokely Carmichael. But it wasn't until 18 months after Malcolm's assassination that his views gained widespread acceptance. Malcolm X had argued that there was no morality in white society and the blacks wouldn't change this by love. It all came to a head in June 1966, on a road in Mississippi. James Meredith had decided to cross the South with only a Bible in his pocket. He called it a march against fear. But while crossing Mississippi, he was gunned down. The symbolism of it all was overpowering. All the civil rights leaders, including King and Carmichael, decided they must continue marching from where Meredith had fallen. 
But for Carmichael and many of the younger blacks, it was a breaking point. They decided to renounce nonviolence, and the press played up the split. Andrew Young. The Mississippi March was very dull. Uh, it was, you know, just walking 20 miles a day in the hot sun. Uh, and guys were around fishing for stories. Uh, and I think that uh, every day they would try to start up, I mean, when there was no conflict with the white community in some places, then they'd try to start up some conflict within the black movement uh, to bring about their, you know, to make their stories interesting. Now, it's true that there were always differences between the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and Dr. King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, but those were differences largely between young ministers and students, which were traditional differences. And very seldom did we ever allow them to become public. But I think that uh, on the Mississippi March, there was almost no way to prevent that. And so the disillusionment of the younger civil rights workers who'd faithfully supported King for so long, could be contained no longer. The civil rights legislation was being implemented only half-heartedly. Hopes and aspirations had been raised only to be frustrated. Stokely Carmichael, leader of the student wing of the civil rights movement, brought the anger to a head. We have to control it. We want black power. 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 Black power. That's right. That's what we want. Black power. And we don't have to be ashamed of it. We have stayed here and we begged the president. We begged the federal government. That's all we've been doing. Begging, begging. It's time we stand up and take over. Take over. We have to do what every group in this country did. We got to take over the communities where we outnumber people so we can have decent jobs. So we can have decent houses. So we can have decent roads. So we can have decent schools. So we can have decent justice. Every courthouse in Mississippi ought to be burned down tomorrow to get rid of the dirt in here. That's it. That's it. Now from now on, when they ask you what you want, you know what to tell them. What do you want? What do you want? What do you want? Everybody, what do you want? How did Black Power evolve at that time in Greenwood five years ago? Oh, it's good that Rix is here, because when we started the march in Mississippi, we had thought about using black power, but we weren't sure whether or not the people would be ready for it. So Rix was selected to go out ahead of the march and work among the sharecroppers, people in the fields, and just see how they would react to the term black power. And he went about a day's march ahead of the march and would just ask people, and then he came back and reported to us that he'd been all the way down to Greenwood and everybody was for black power. And it was just a question of where would we use the term, at what time? Dr. King was marching with us all the time. And uh, Dr. King had to leave before Greenwood to go somewhere. I can't remember where, but he would leave the march. He'd come back the day after. And we had said we would pitch some tents in Greenwood. And we went to pitch the tents and Rick's told me that if we pitched the tents, I'd be arrested. And he said, if, if we got arrested, he would mobilize the people and I'd be out of jail and they'd be waiting for me at the rally. <laughs> and so we pitched the tents and we got arrested. Ricks got us out of jail. And the people were waiting. And Dr. King was not there. <laughs> and Black Power came out. And how did it exactly happen? Well, we had talked about it. You know, we had discussed it. We decided where Greenwood would be the place. So I just made a speech building up to it. Building up, building up, building up, showing that it wasn't a question of morality, it wasn't a question of being good or bad, it was simply a question of power. And the weak black people had no power, and we had to have some power. The only type of power we could have is black power. Black power. And uh, since uh, Willie Ricks is a good organizer, the people were well seasoned. They responded immediately in a healthy manner. Dr. King came back the next day, but it was too late then. Black power had been established. Why do you think these ordinary people, sharecroppers and the like, did respond so quickly to the suggestion of black power? We knew their problems. I mean, we lived with them. We slept on their floors. We picked cotton with them. Our job was to organize them. We knew that they knew that they were powerless. 
They just couldn't find a way to articulate it. But we knew that they knew they were powerless. Thus we knew once they knew the, que the question was power. And once they were able to see and understand and grasp the concept of power, that they would, they would of course respond. And they did. They did immediately, not only them, but people all over the world. Dr. King's feeling was that, you know, he had no problem with uh, the concept of black power. He just didn't think it was a tactically wise slogan, but it did catch on. But the fact that it did catch on in the way it did, and mm -hmm. you have to accept the press is the press, wasn't it a mistake? to retreat from it and allow Stokely Carmichael to come running through with it. And I think his sense was that slogans basically are substanceless and that uh, the important thing is to develop real power. Uh, and he used the phrase that uh, the Catholics in America had power, but you never talked about Catholic power. Uh, the Jews in America had power, but nobody ever said anything about Jewish power. In fact, people who were really attaining power were always very anxious to deny it. Uh, and it was only people who had no power uh, that went around sloganizing about power. And I think he saw that, uh, uh, I, I think he liked Stokely. And he really didn't want to oppose Stokely. He saw Stokely as a very promising young man. Uh, and he didn't want to oppose him personally. He was always anxious to see young leadership uh, emerge and grow up. But black power since then has taken on overtones of violence and nearly all its varieties. And surely this right from the beginning was a fear that Dr. King had and was one reason for him opposing it. Well, I, I guess so, but uh, even then it was defensive violence. Uh, and, uh, and I doubt, I really believe that the connotations of black power uh, were supplied by the white community. And when white Americans heard blacks say black power and clench their fists, their, in their mind, blacks were now going to do to them all the evil things that whites had done to blacks during the last 200 years. Now, I don't think that was in the thinking of even the most militant black men. I think black power for them meant the right to determine their own destiny. It meant power over their own lives. It meant power to influence their community and, and uh, to make changes in their nation which brought about a better economic and political life for them. Um, and so you, you really had two groups missing each other, very literally. Another widespread misconception about black power is that its leaders were responsible for the big city riots of Newark and Detroit in 1967, when 68 people lost their lives. President Johnson set up a commission to look at the causes of the riots. One of its members was Senator Fred Harris, a southerner and a former chairman of the Democratic Party. Did the commission find the Black Power leaders were behind the riots? No, we found that there was no uh, conspiracy or any organization to the riots and uh, we had uh, access to FBI and uh, CIA and other kinds of, uh, of files and we became convinced of that. We had our own uh, uh, very competent investigator and what uh, we found was that the tensions were so great and the hostilities were so uh, immense that almost any kind of thing would trigger off uh, violence in the summertime in those cities. So it wasn't people like Stokely Carmichael who were the cause of the riots? Not in an approximate way. Uh, I came back uh, from uh, the first trip I made into uh, Cincinnati and I sat down uh, with President Johnson and I said to him, uh, Mr. President, We've uh, lost the Stokely Carmichaels and the Rap Browns. They had been involved in the most uh, establishment uh, kind of things before, that is, the registration of voters in the South. They be became uh, very frustrated, uh, even with trying to secure that kind of uh, fundamental right for people, and, uh, have, uh, and, and they've really been lost to us. While a focus of attention continued on black power, Dr. King was struggling against the white backlash in Chicago.
Not only was he losing many of his young black supporters, but he was finding white resistance to his own non-violence fiercer than ever before. Always his courage was formidable. I just want to do God's will. And he has allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Two years after black power broke out, Martin Luther King was dead. Although in these two years his popularity among many of the younger blacks had decreased, he was never overshadowed by black militancy, as newspaper coverage often suggested. He played a central role in developing the opposition to the war in Vietnam. He established black electoral politics on a firm footing. At the time of his death, he was welding together a powerful coalition of poor whites, Mexicans, Indians, Puerto Ricans and blacks. Despite the apparent distance between nonviolence and black power, Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael were not estranged. No, no, we spent a great deal of time together because I moved to Atlanta at that time and I was living in Atlanta. He was also living in Atlanta. On Sunday mornings, I would get up and go to his church because I loved to hear Dr. King preach. He, he could preach. Dr. King could preach. I'd listen to him preach and I'd go to his house and have dinner with him. His wife would cook and on Sunday evenings, when we had a chance, we would sit down and talk and laugh. Uh, we'd even kid about each other's political positions. Uh, I would always tell him that he'd have to come closer to mine, and he'd say that I was just a little bit too young, that as I matured, I would begin to see things a little bit better. And, and, uh, it was, I, I never felt estranged from Dr. King at all. I don't think he ever felt estranged from me. I always, he was older than I was, thus there was always a relationship of respect. Uh, I had respect for him as an older man. I had respect for him for the fights that he led. I mean, it was his fight in Montgomery, Alabama, not too far from here, that sparked a lot of us, you know, so that I've always respected that. I could not but respect it because I'm a student of history. What impact did his death have on you then? I was sorry that he was killed. Um, I guess most people were, but that's life. They, he died for what he believed in, and in that sense, he was a lucky man. Very few people get a chance to die for what they believe in. Few people believe in anything. It's in the South that Dr. King's legacy can best be seen. Today, ways that ten years ago seemed timeless and fixed have slowly begun to change. Blacks have won a degree of political control. They're setting up their own businesses, often pooling their limited resources to get them off the ground. There is yet a long way to go, when even the churches are still segregated but whites within themselves are being forced to think about what, ten years ago, was unthinkable. Miss Margaret Thackeray's family have lived in the South, in this house, since the time of slavery. You can't, in one day, change right about face uh, the next day. After all, we're just human beings, and we just, we, we have lived like this, and all of a sudden they make dramatic changes in the lives of people, and demanding that these things be done. I think that's what the, the South was in. It just give us time. It was sort of like in the war between the states. My grandmother used to say, honey, they were going to, uh, it was gradually going down. Slavery was going down. It was an impossible situation. They couldn't keep it up. And these changes today, are people ad adjusting to them in the same way, they, do you they, think? They're adjusting to them. The, 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 they're adjusting to them here. You see, in the North, it was an it's an entirely different situation. You get them in these great big cities, and they live in the, in the ghettos and all like that. Well, here in the South, they lived among us. All right, there's my, right down there, I've got my, my uh, this colored man that used to work for me, and he's not able to anymore. 
And so he just comes up to my house and he gets his, I give him a place to stay in and give him his meals because he, he decided he's just going to come on anyway. So, all right, I've got, that, there he is right there. And, I, and, I, and I'll give you a little thing that might give you an idea of what it's like. And he said, Miss Margaret, he said, you know, I was just thinking the other day, if anything were to happen to you, I want to still keep my house. Do you mind giving me a little piece of paper and write it on there and say I can stay in that house until I die? I said, all right, I hadn't thought about it, but I'll be happy to do that. The Harrell family in a small town store in a part of Alabama where the blacks are in a majority. In today's climate, do they have any black friends whom they'd invite into their home? Uh, there are classes of people, and the majority of the Negro people in this county are, are of a very low economic level with whom you have very little in common. There are some that are on as high an economic level as, uh, say, the, the majority of the white people are, school principals, uh, school teachers, uh, school supervisors who are Negroes. These people uh, would be uh, welcome to uh, come into um, my home, but... Uh, but you wouldn't want people to know about it? No, not really. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that I wouldn't advertise. Not because I'm fearful of being shot. <laughs> <laughs> not that, but... Um, I would be afraid of what some little children in the third grade would say to my uh, little boy who's in the third grade about what your daddy does, you know. What sort of things might they say? Well, they might say, uh, your daddy um, is a nigger lover, you know, mightn't they? Um, or they might say, um, your daddy is sorry, you know, he's trashy, he eats with uh, niggers. Before the civil rights uh, activity, would you have thought of having a black person home for lunch? Do you uh, think it made you face up to some of the issues in your own life? Well, it, it might have. It certainly uh, did do this. It made us and the colored people aware of the of the power that does exist through the uh, through the vote, and I think it has made us realize that we do have to work these problems out. Whereas before, we would have said that there was no particular problem to be worked out, mm -hmm. right? Cainville, Lowndes County, the heart of Alabama, where many of the great civil rights battles were fought. It's the county where Stokely Carmichael and the student wing of the civil rights movement first organized blacks to vote. Today, Carmichael lives in Guinea, Africa. In April, with his wife, the singer Miriam McCabe, he made a short visit to the United States. Now he distrusts the media, but allowed us to be the only film crew with him when he returned to the place where three of his fellow workers had been murdered. Here he met the man he'd helped become the first black sheriff. John Hewlett, sheriff, Lyons <laughs> County. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Power. <laughs> Truthfully, I, I felt one day it would happen, but I never thought in terms of running for sheriff. I just hope it continues. What kind of gun you carry now? I'm using a fully special small. Uh, all right. I'm going to use a larger gun. I'm just using something like Oh, yeah. 30. 30. <laughs> 30. Mm -hmm. oh, 38 to myself. Legal. You can do it any time you want. I'm too small to walk around with a heavy gun. You do? <laughs> that really is good. That's so good to see you. Well, I'm glad to see you too. Glad to see you back. How long do you think you'll be around in this area? Well, I have to leave tonight, unfortunately. I got to be in North Carolina. I got a, a bigger base now. A bigger, bigger, bigger base. <laughs> okay, you should have seen me in Guinea. Where are the pictures, Anzi? Where are the pictures? I got the show. Who are the gentlemen you got here? They're in the record cover. Hey, could you get it? No, I got to show you this picture, man. Oh, okay. I'm going to show you. You got you a little thing. I'm going to show you what I carry in my town. What you got is some real I'm going to show you what I carry in my town. <laughs> okay, then. And I'm going to show you how revolutionary we are in my town. Good. My wife is my deputy. 
So that's my deputy oh. there. <laughs> that's what we carry. Yeah, we don't play, man. That's what I carry. My time. That's what I carry. And I have a little one on the side that you can't can, see can on this picture. Hey, look here. Hey, look here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's my wife. Okay. Where should we go? Inside here. And then you're gonna, they're gonna come to get us? Uh, for lunch, you mean? Yes. We can leave here and go down. We're just a few blocks away from it. Okay. Okay. Hands relief. We're going in. I remember, hey man, I remember the last time I went in here. <laughs> Lucy Davis, wife of a sharecropper earning seven pounds a week, remembers that it was in Lowndes County that Black Power first began. Yes, it was because we had all white power here, and he, it wasn't a radical word as they used it, but the whites had all the power because they were in office and we had no blight. Therefore, we had no black power. We had no one to represent us. We were just paying tax without representation. And what have you achieved with this black power? We have achieved great, we have achieved, we have achieved around uh, 2,500 registered voters. More, but I can say 2,500. And how many did exact. you have before? Before Stoke again, mm -hmm. not a one. So you moved from none to 2,500. Right. And we move into various programs. We learn a lot about law. We learn our rights. And we learn where to, what source to tackle to get our rights when we needed them. I can't express the words and the meanings that I was when I heard that he was coming. He taught us how to organize ourselves. He would walk from door to door and he would tell us, people, get registered to vote. That's one of the first steps toward progress. When you register, when you vote, you have control and you have power. Of course, he would use the word blight power. It was in this small wooden church five years ago that Carmichael first developed the idea of black power. Now he returns with a new theme. Good evening. It's it's good to be home again. It's been quite some time. We came into Lowndes County. Weren't too many people wanted to come into Lowndes County. Folk were afraid of Lowndes County. But we said Lowndes County is the worst county. That's where the white man got our people afraid. If we go in there and crack that nut, all the others will fall like straws. We came into Lowndes County. We worked hard in Lowndes County. All of us worked hard. I'm not just talking about Bob Manns, myself, Scotty B, Willie Ricks, Ralph Featherstone, and all the other young people. We were young then, we're a little bit older now. Most of us are married, but we haven't stopped fighting. We can never stop fighting. We can only stop fighting when all our people are free. We can never stop fighting until all our people are free or a bullet stops us from fighting. The only reason you started to get a sheriff was because you began to think that you could get a sheriff. That's how you get a sheriff. When you think you could get a sheriff, then you get up and get you a sheriff. But before that, you didn't think about a sheriff. You didn't know about a sheriff. You thought only white folk could be a sheriff. You thought black people weren't qualified to be a sheriff until you began to think about being a sheriff. We will consolidate our power in Lowndes County. We will work to consolidate our power. We will work to get more people elected who will speak for us. We will do that. We will continue to do that. But in the meantime, we must set higher goals. We must set higher goals. We must seek to build a big nation a nation that will protect us. That's what we're doing in Africa. We've got to build a power so strong and so powerful that nobody will ever mess with a black man again anywhere in the world. We've got to build a power. What's the purpose of you being in Africa at this time? Well, the purpose of being in Africa is that I see Africa as a primary objective. I see the total liberation and unification of Africa as a primary, a primary objective of all black people. We must make Africa strong. If we don't make Africa strong, we'll never be respected. Thus, because it is my primary objective and I have the 
means and the availability and the opportunity to go to Africa, I go to Africa. But isn't this sort of rather a, an intellectual concept? It's not the kind of bread and butter issue that means something to the average sharecropper or the average man who lives in the ghetto working, driving a bus in Chicago or something. In terms of immediate goals, you're right. But in terms of long-range goals, it is bread and butter. Uh, and when one makes an ideology, one's ideology must be geared to long-range programs. And if we stayed here and just fought for the bread and butter issues, we'd have bread and butter issues. But later on, we would have nothing. Chicago, the richest city in America, also the most racially segregated. It's the city that gave Martin Luther King his severest setback, the city where one-third of the population lived virtually abandoned in the world's largest black ghetto. Nevertheless, Jesse Jackson, once an aide to Dr. King, has emerged as the single most powerful black leader in Chicago and is now being built up nationally as the heir to Dr. King. Good morning, y'all. I am somebody. I am somebody. I may be poor, but I am somebody. I may be on welfare, but I am somebody. I may be hungry, but I am somebody. I am black, beautiful, proud. I must be respected. I must be respected. I am God's child. I am God's child. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Look out. 4,000 people come to hear Jesse Jackson preach every Saturday morning. This is the week of commemoration for Dr. King's services. Some people worry about how we support ourselves. Little people support us with little contribution. And that's why we represent little people. This is the basis of his popular strength, but it's also because of his organizational ability that he's had much more success in Chicago than Dr. King ever had. And I would rather be in God's minority moving toward a brighter situation than to be in the devil's majority doomed to hell if I had a choice this moment. <laughs> Who said that the majority is right? That's who crucified Jesus. Who said the majority is right? That's who stood by while Socrates drank from the hemlock. Who said the majority is right? That's who put Nixon in office. By the word about no majority being right.
The white world of Chicago glides by clean and antiseptic. Mainstream American society with its wealth, its splendor and smoothness is to be looked at but not touched, provoking but unreachable. It's not easy to live in the ghetto, to find joy and happiness. It's easy to turn against society and hate it, just hate it. After all, what's it given you? Often, not even a job. 40% of young black men are out of work. This family is typical. Crowded and demoralized, it takes little to bring up their resentment. Do you find yourself getting very angry with white people, Joyce? Yes. White society? Yes. I'm pretty, pretty, pretty. <laughs> I hate white people. I do. I mean, what? I hate them. I mean, I feel cheated. We've been, I say, in America like, for about 300 years to been here, you know. And, well, we come up on the little end of everything, but everything in America that has been accomplished, a black man did it. But we get no credit for it at all. Everything is white. This is whitest world. We just exist in it. I just exist. I can't speak for nobody else. It's whitest world, and I don't like it. Which of the black leaders, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, Jesse Jackson or others, which of these do you think have done most for you and which method that they have used as the one that you think would be successful in the future? Martin. Why do you say that? Why do you say Malcolm X? I like his philosophy. I mean, you know, he's, and Stokely Carmichael too. Nonviolence is okay, but you get nowhere with nonviolence. I like violence. Malcolm X started, but King finished. Uh, Malcolm X set the, you know, set the idea. He rooted it rather in the minds of many blacks. He really started to think the ball rolling. You feel that violence is necessary in order to get rid of what you would call the oppression? It wouldn't get rid of it. But it will open, you know, some of Whitey's eyes to say, well, you know, we're not joking, we really mean what we say. Do you find yourself really hating white people? Mm, yes. And why do you think you do? Really, it's just my attitude about things. I mean, if I hate something, I just hate it. And I think about, well, you know, some people hold grudges, and I do. Look how they treat me. How many flows did my great-grandmother struck, you know? How many babies did she take care of that wasn't hers? You know, stuff like that. And I'm just one of those people with whole things. What kind of way do you think is going to work? Ain't no kind of way it's going to work. You see what happened to Malcolm X, Dr. Luther King, and pretty soon it's going to happen to our Jesse Jackson because they're fighting for what they want. Uh, Malcolm X tried. Martin Luther tried. He was a nonviolent man. What happened? They shot him down like he was a dog. Pretty soon they're going to do this to Jesse Jackson. And I feel the only way that uh, black people can get what they want is fight for. The Black Panthers are the most notorious of all the militant groups that have grown out of the frustration of the black neighborhoods. They began as a movement to stop the everyday police brutality in the ghettos. But they did it with guns. Taking on the police like this inevitably led to a kind of suicide. They were outgunned by a society ruthlessly determined to put them down. The government, if not actually approving of such police excesses, tolerated them. Senator Harris. By and large, I think the, uh, you can demonstrate that violence does not uh, bring about progress. That, as a matter of fact, it more often than not brings on repression and that if uh, there's a dilemma posed whether we'll have anarchy or repression, then I haven't any doubt that this government, like most governments, would, uh, would go on the side of repression. Bobby Rush, the Chicago leader of the Black Panthers, has now been forced to spell out a policy of retreat. The most important thing that to occupy the mind of any black person in this country today is survival. People in the, our community got the idea that the only way that they could relate to the Black Panther Party was to pick up a gun. 
We say, no, that's not the only way. That's in the end, that probably would be the only way. But at this time, we know that the consciousness of the people isn't at the level where everybody's going to pick up a gun. So what are we going to do? We're coming back to the community. Anything the community wants us to do, whether it be elections, whether it be going to church every Sunday, anything the community people want us to do, the Black Panther Party is going to be there. The Panthers are now a long way from the gun-toting image that so terrified America. America is too top-heavy to be toppled by angry black ghetto teenagers, and the Panthers have finally learned that lesson. They're reduced to the simple things of life, like giving hungry children breakfast and propaganda. The Panthers' tactics have brought them more publicity than any other group, but that alone is not enough for successful revolution. It's not surprising that Stokely Carmichael, the most sophisticated of all militant leaders, lives in Africa and visits America only occasionally. He sees the fight in terms of decades, and in his recent lecture tour, he was more concerned with changing long-term perspectives than winning short-term goals. We went with him. When you see an individual white boy, you're not afraid of that individual white boy. What you are afraid of is the power that he represents. Because behind him stands the local police force, the state militia, the army, the navy, the air force. When you see an African, there is no power behind him. There is no one speaking for his interest. There is no one to protect him. We must get land in Africa. <laughs> the Jews have already set the president for us. Jews, whether they live in California, Miami, New York, London, Italy, Paris, or Brussels, their major preoccupation is building a strong Israel. Building a strong Israel. We have Jewish senators in this country. They get up in Congress and all they talk about is Israel needs guns, Israel needs planes, Israel needs money. All they are concerned with is building a strong Israel. We must get land in Africa. The Caribbean is full of black people, and our mother continent, Africa, there is to be found millions and millions and millions and millions of black people. Black power means all of these millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of black people coming together to form black power. Land is power. Power is land. Land is power. Power is land. Black power is the black man in control of black land. You are students. You are revolutionary intelligentsia. The guerrilla studies. The guerrilla studies. The guerrilla studies. He doesn't rap, he studies and keeps his mouth shut. Study, children, study! 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 It's not easy to assess Carmichael's influence. Certainly, he has tremendous appeal. A large segment of black America is perpetually angry. After all, since 1960, the number of blacks living in poverty has actually grown. Nevertheless, that's only part of the picture. The economic position of the majority has improved. Blacks today have a larger share of the national wealth than they did 10 years ago. There are now twice as many blacks in higher education than there are students in Britain. That's why, in fact, most blacks don't practice violence, even though the rhetoric is so often violent and revolutionary. 
Jesse Jackson is convinced anyway that violent revolution couldn't succeed. Number one, I think violence is self-destructive. I think for black folk in America, it is military and practical. But beyond that, I think it ultimately, it ultimately leads to the kind of insanity of the Cali incident uh, in Vietnam. And I think that the, the conduct of the world has to move from massive ways to kill people to massive ways to heal people. I think we're beyond the states where nonviolence is associated with some effeminate softness, but whether nonviolence is beginning to be seen as the medicine or the antidote to a sick world. In what ways do you see this being deployed in the next decade? Well, I, I would think that the political movements we've seen in this country, where we have from no male to 55. This is the history of, of uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic behavior in the United States of America. The Irish came and they organized themselves in the cities and, and accumulated tremendous political power and finally wound up sending one of their sons to the White House. Uh, this is true of the Poles, this is true of the Italians, and almost every major ethnic group in, in the United States. Why not, uh, why, why should not that work for black people also? Now, I don't, however, delude myself into believing that uh, black mayors alone, for example, are going to be able to exercise a sufficient amount of power to free black people in this country. That is, to free them economically and to free them in other ways that they need to be freed. Obviously, for, obviously, uh, for example, I do not control the economic institutions in this community. The banks are still controlled by persons uh, who, uh, in most cases, have moved out, who live in the suburbs, but who still control the finances of this community. The jobs. Uh, our major employer in Gary, Indiana, is United States Steel. No black man sits on the board of United States Steel, nor does any black man uh, hold any position of real authority in that massive uh, corporation. So uh, being mayor of Gary has not made it possible uh, for me to control things like jobs and the economic conditions of black people. It has made it possible for me to alleviate the suffering of many black people in this community. Good evening, I'm Bob Wallace, here's the news. Reverend Jesse Jackson of Operation Breadbasket is quoted today as saying he's extending his leave of absence in order to work toward a national third political party. Jackson has been on leave from his job as Operation Breadbasket's director for the past few months to work on the upcoming campaign for mayor. In an interview in the Chicago Sun-Times, he said the party would be created for the purpose of nominating a black man for president in 1972, and also might bargain for the nomination of a black man for a vice president at the Democratic National Convention. WBBM-TV reporter Michelle Clark has more on that story. Michelle? Bob, for the past few weeks, local and national leaders have been speculating on Reverend Jackson's plans and the future of the civil rights movement. I don't think we can settle any longer for saying that the Republicans are writing us off and the Democrats are taking us for granted, but the Democrats are a little better than the Republicans. If they are a little better, but in fact doing no more, it means that they are deceptive. I'm tired of choosing between two evils. I'm concerned today, brothers and sisters, about us developing something new, not based on race, but based on values. There's a greater gap between the greedy and the needy, the rich and the poor, than there is between the black and the white. The fact is, where black and white dislike each other or not, we ain't got no choice but to live with each other. We are here men. We got to live with each other. Jackson, like Martin Luther King before him, is probably right in his supposition that most blacks would rather be a part of mainstream America than be entirely on their own. That doesn't mean they're not burning with resentment and bitterness. After years of broken promises and dashed expectations, so many of them obviously are. But they're an increasingly sophisticated people, aware of the art of the possible. Black people today have got opportunities that 15 years ago would have been thought unachievable. 
And in a society where revolution seems a remote possibility, most people will settle for that. Revolutionary militancy is, by and large, the preserve of the young. And the fact is, people aren't young for very long. Nevertheless, as long as such disparities of wealth and privilege exist in America, the militants will be around, making sure that those who do advance don't forget those they've left behind, and reminding people of their ultimate goals. Stokely Carmichael. I want, like most Africans all over the world, to see Africa liberated and unified. Thus, every day of my life, I must strive, however little, I, whatever little I can do, to do that. If I can just convince another African that this is what he must be concerned with, I'm satisfied. Until we get to the point where we can organize to do it properly. And do you see this in your lifetime? I see the beginnings of it in my lifetime. The struggle that we have ahead of it is a long struggle. It's a hard struggle. It is probably the bloodiest struggle the world will ever see. But it's incumbent upon my generation to run the race, and we must run the race as well as we can. My generation will not see the finish line, but the generation that comes behind us will. If they see the finish line, we have seen the finish line. A society that would either inflict physical disease upon children, or when told that certain practices were leading to premature debilitation or disease or death would continue those practices. It would seem to me it would be difficult to uh, call such a society civilized, no matter how powerful it was technologically, industrially, or militarily. But, uh, to me, the test of the civilization of any nation or social system, European, American, or Asian, or African, is whether that society puts its major efforts in trying to conserve human beings rather than being insensitive or deliberately destructive in regard to human beings. I think that uh, the fact that black people now have this increasing feeling of group pride and, and a positive self-image, that that is changing white society. There's so many white people in this country all their lives had never seen a black person except in a very uh, uh, menial, subservient role. Now, over and over, they're seeing black people who are not going to be uh, pushed around or treated as second-class citizens. And that's changing white attitudes, and it's white attitudes that must change. I am somebody. I am somebody. I may be poor, but I am somebody. I may be on welfare. But I am somebody. somebody. I, may somebody. I may be hungry. But I am, I am. Somebody. somebody. I may be uneducated. I may be unskilled. But I am somebody. I am black, beautiful, beautiful. Proud. proud. I must be respected. I must be respected. I must be protected. I am somebody. I am God's child. I am God's child. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Look out.